Order! 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 You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! First of all today, French authorities have begun the process of clearing the giant migrant camp in Calais known as the jungle. Coaches have been chartered to take migrants to reception centres across France, where they'll be invited to apply for asylum or deported to their country of origin. A few minutes ago I spoke to our correspondent in Calais, Sophie Long, and I asked her how the operation's been going. Well, Joe, so far the operation has been running very smoothly. Since the early hours of this morning, hundreds of migrants have come here and formed orderly queues. As you can see behind me, they go into that reception centre. They're asked for their names, for their nationalities, their ages, and then they've been boarding buses quite swiftly. Normally the process is taking about half an hour and leaving Calais. So far this morning, we are told by the authorities here that 17 buses have left, carrying on them some 700 migrants. They have been told though, that there will not be enough buses for everyone to get on today. So some people will come back here and the process will continue tomorrow. Many of the migrants I've spoken to in the queues for that reception centre have said they are happy to leave. Some of them have been here for many months. I was speaking to one young man from Afghanistan. He said he's been here for eight months. It is cold, it is dirty, life is difficult there and he was pleased to be moving somewhere where he'll be provided with proper accommodation and food. Others though say they will not leave. They have one very clear goal, and that is to start a new life in the UK. Some of those people say that they will not move from Calais. To move further into France and away from this port is to move further away from their dream of a new life in England. Right, so there is going to be some resistance to clearing those people who, as you say, want to still make it to the shores of the UK. What are the French authorities saying about that? Well, the French authorities are being very clear that this is an eviction, the camp will be closed, it will be dismantled. Other people, though, uh, the charities who are working very closely with the migrants in that camp, their advice is also very clear to follow the uh, instructions of the French authorities. That is the safest route and the best route to claiming asylum here in France. They also say to me, the charities who are working with those people, that while the camp is full, it's easier for them to say, hey, we're going to stay here, but they hope hope that as people move on over the days that come they will change their minds and get on the buses that have been provided for them. But people living in Calais, they have some sympathy for people who've been living in this camp for some of them more than a year now. And they say that their great worry is that even if this camp is closed, people who do remain here will just simply find somewhere else to stay and the whole problem will start all over again. Sophie Long at The Jungle in Calais. Thank you. Gisela Stewart, let's just pick up on that final point uh, by Sophie Long there in Calais. Is this actually going to solve the problem, dispersing the migrants across France, or are we just going to see lots of new jungles emerging? Well, we must make sure that this doesn't happen. I mean, uh, one of the difficulties is that because of the free travel zone of, of, of Schengen on, on mainland Europe, that once you've got the pressure on the outside of, of, of the periphery borders and once people are inside that area, they can just travel wherever they want to. But how do you prevent it happening? Well, this is where you, you know, at some stage the French and the Italians were talking about reintroducing some of their border controls. Uh, you, you have to deal with, with the pressure on the outside. The deal with Turkey, which they uh, struck with the, the, mainly under the lead of the Germans, that actually isn't working properly. So y you, do, you have to do the triple thing, which is between the, 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 the people traders uh, and essentially you know, who, who pay them. Mm. You deal with the displacement as you have in, 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 in the wake of Syria. And then you also deal with, with, with a certain pull factor. And on top of that, I do hope that one thing Britain has to do is live up to its promise in dealing with some of the unaccompanied children. Right, well, let's come to that. that you, you're nodding your head there because there is a fear um, and Lord Dubbs, Lord Alf Dubbs, who uh, made a big play and in fact tried to uh, persuade the government to take the unaccompanied children who are in the camps uh, in Cali, is worried that actually, because they're clearing it now, not all those children have come across from France. So do you think they are going to be dispersed across France before we manage to get them here? 
Well, I hope not. I mean, clearly it is going very slowly. These children are starting to arrive in the UK. It's a complicated process. Um, I became aware of that when looking at how my local authority of West Sussex was dealing with it uh, and all of the various processes that they have to put in place, the checks. It's not straightforward. And there are also if been got issues about... Here. No, it's, not, it, it's still not straightforward because right. they have first to be processed by the, the council, then given to the families who they have a connection with. Uh, and so... Uh, there is a necessary amount of bureaucracy around it. We do need to speed it up as far as possible, but we also need to maintain confidence in the process. And I think it would be very damaging, actually, to the principal uh, if we started to take people who weren't actually eligible or uh -huh. uh, there were concerns about whether, whether they were the right age or not. Right, it's so you agree with I your mean, colleagues on, on that, some of them who raise concerns that actually there need to be more checks. Would you like to see further checks, dental checks. I know they were rejected no, by... No, I certainly above... wouldn't want to see dental checks. Right. I, mean, I thought that was an appalling suggestion and it's, it, and it's been rejected by the British Dental Association that says it's unethical. But that, I'm just making the point, there have to be proper checks. This has to be done properly. Let's just remember, we have taken over 5,000 Syrian refugees, uh, not children, but adults, uh, in the last few years. Have they been uh, granted asylum or they've been given protection and of course there's a commitment to to um, take 20,000 directly from the camps over plus the next an enormous, five years. Uh, plus an enormous humanitarian effort the second biggest contributor in the world L financially we are doing our bit let me just uh, pick up on what Nick Herbert said would you like to see further checks to verify the ages of the unaccompanied minors who are claiming asylum here or joining families uh, the, the age check has to be one, one, one of those processes. Or when you verify. Sure, that's in place, but would you yeah. like to see further checks to verify the age? Or are you, uh, uh, like Nick Herbert, you, did, you didn't want to see dental checks to actually uh, try and, and uh, verify the ages? Would you like to see other checks come into place? If, if anybody convinces me that they are better than what we've got at the moment, then, then I'm, I'm open to the suggestion. But I just didn't think that the, the dental checks in particular were the, were, were the answer to the problem. No. Right. What about those uh, migrants who are in the camps who just want to come to the UK? Um, they're going to try and stay. Uh, whether they'll be able to, we'll have to wait and see. Um, what about those people? Because they're not going to give up, are they? Well, some of them might not, but others are being offered proper accommodation and, of course, uh, they're being taken through the asylum uh, process. Uh, I, I mean, I think there are issues, exactly as Gizza says. You know, why have they got to this point? Uh, if they are asylum seekers, sure. when they've got as far as France, uh, the rules are that they're meant to be offered asylum in the first country that they uh, arrive at. They're not unsafe, after all, in, in France itself. So there is a problem, a wider problem with Europe and Schengen and its borders, and that has got to be solved partly by the agreement that was made uh, with Turkey, partly uh, by Europe itself. All right. But I think we all agree that you know, these really aren't easy, uh, these, um, uh, these, these problems, and I think it's just generally wrong to try and make political capital out of them. One by one, the coaches drove away, carrying up to 2,000 people out of the jungle migrant camp in Calais, destined for reception centres across France. Authorities will begin to dismantle the camp tomorrow, but they've already begun in some cases. Residents have been told that if they refuse to leave, they could face deportation. The operation to clear it out is expected to last a week. The only group allowed to stay, unaccompanied children, who will be taken to a secure area inside the camp. Our correspondent, Porrick O'Brien, is there. Porrick. Well, John, as evacuations go, one for the French history books today. The figures on the number of people that they've managed to relocate out of the jungle have just arrived in, and we can confirm that they've nearly reached the 2,000 mark of adults that they've managed to relocate out of the jungle, and they've managed to relocate 400 unaccompanied minors to the container section of the jungle just behind me. And those figures is sort of borne out here tonight. Last, no last night I was standing same place, same time, with tear gas volleys going on over our head. But as you can see, a much calmer place tonight. This is how the day panned out. This morning, with music blaring from what used to be the kids' cafe, they were burning bits of the jungle. Inside had the desolate feel of an apocalyptic after party. Outside the queue. <laughs> Hundreds of people from the camp frantically funneled into a giant warehouse to be relocated across France. And by lunchtime, 700 people had got through. It was looking like the enormous logistics operation to clear the camp was working. 
So this is just the head of the adult queue, and it's mainly adult young men. You can see them here with their suitcases aloft, trying to make their way into the warehouse. This queue is going to be divided into about four. We've got the, the, the adults only queue, mainly young men, as I say, on this side. Um, then there's families, unaccompanied minors and vulnerable individuals. It was mainly young men from the Horn of Africa leaving the camp, joining the queue. At one point, what looked like a rowdy demo turned out to be a farewell party. How long have you all lived together in the jungle? Eight months. In you've been in 18 months, eight is that months, right? months, yeah. So you've become friends, all of this group of men? Yeah, today I'm very sad because okay. my friend is going. The scale of this operation is immense, designed to transport over 7,000 migrants during the week. People will be brought to 167 asylum centres around France. Three and a half thousand police are involved. So this is the logistics of the immigration crisis, French style. People are coming through this tent. On this table, they've been given purple bracelets. On this table, they've been given pink bracelets. Those bracelets correspond to regions in France. As they work their way through, they'll board buses at the back of the warehouse and be brought to uh, refugee centres scattered all around France. The jungle is not the first reincarnation of a giant migrant camp in these parts. So a question for the region's most senior official. What, what people in the UK want to know is, why did you let it get to this point? We have reached that point because of what's going on in the world. Kelly is not responsible for what's happening. Yeah, no, I, I know, I know. I, of course, there's a, there, there, is a, there is an international responsibility as well. But at the end of the day, you allowed a refugee camp to develop in your community that's been sitting here for three or four years. So why, why so long? Why didn't you sort it before? Since the 16th century, Calais has been a place of migration, but we are managing this now. The number of migrants became too high. We are gradually dismantling the camp. There's a process, there's a rationale to this. The people that want to leave and seek asylum in France are doing so, but what of those that remain, the hundreds still in the camp, digging in? We are sure that uh, they will all have to go anyway. So. Uh, whether they accept uh, and, uh, and they agree to go uh, on their own uh, in, in the, the buses or they will be forced to do so and yeah. might be arrested so we'll see we'll okay. see tomorrow one day after so where's the next jungle going to be in england <laughs> we followed one of the buses an hour and a half south <laughs> to the town of Kwasi. The refugees and migrants here will be housed in a former nursing home. We don't meant any harm for anyone. We come in peace, really, and we just want to live. So we left our country just to have this moment of peace here. But also acknowledgement that the whole town is not in the welcome party. It's a very quiet village. Uh, all the people are um, normally uh, gentle and uh, say hello to each other. And um, now we have seen a division of the village. Today is the beginning of the end of the jungle. For France, though, it's the start of hundreds of other stories. Orca Bryan in the jungle. Britain has now taken in around 200 children from Calais, including 60 girls at risk of sexual exploitation, according to the Home Secretary. Amber Rudd told MPs that British officials were doing everything they could to speed up the process and more children will arrive in the coming weeks. While they wait to be reunited with relatives or found care, the children will be housed in temporary accommodation, like one centre in North Devon, from where our Home Affairs correspondent Andy Davis now reports. They wore Paddington Bear masks in London today, the character paraded by these demonstrators as the city's most famous child refugee. They were calling for urgent protection for all the children in Calais' disappearing camp. And soon afterwards, a few streets away in Westminster, the Home Secretary claimed her officials had been focusing hard on this very issue. In the last few weeks, she said, progress had been made. Working in partnership with the French, we have transferred almost 200 children. This includes more than 60 girls, many of whom had been identified as at high risk of sexual exploitation. They are receiving the care and support they need in the UK. Such has been the speed of events in recent days, 
the Home Office has been quietly having to expand its asylum estate. It emerged over the weekend that in the North Devon countryside near Great Torrington, they've hired an accommodation centre to house, temporarily, up to 70 children from the Calais camp. In the middle of last week, the Home Office contacted us, Devon County Council, and said we found a site in North Devon that they think we might be suitable to take unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. We convened with health colleagues, police colleagues, and we looked at the site and decided that we were able to support the Home Office as long as they restricted numbers to about 70. The centre, which isn't far from here, took in its first teenagers, 20 of them, early this morning. They're all boys, originally from Syria, Somalia and Afghanistan, I understand. We've also been told that their ages were verified twice before they got here and that they'll only be staying at the centre for a matter of days. Until that is, they're reunited with family members or are taken into the care of a local authority somewhere in the UK. Some in the town have complained there's been a lack of consultation on this, but most we spoke to this afternoon approved of the scheme. Well, I just hope they'll be looked after properly. And if I could do anything to support them, I would. I mean, even if you want to object, you can't really. You know, it's, it's, if it's there, it's there. It's, it's something that's in place. So. Do you welcome something like that? Honestly, no. I can't say it bothers me. I'm glad that they've found somewhere hopefully to go. This and other similar centres around the UK will be in place for several weeks, we're told, as more Calais children come. This includes those with close family links to the UK, as well as some of those without. And priority in these cases will be given to the under-12s, those at high risk of sexual exploitation, and those likely to be granted asylum. And only, as the Home Secretary said today, if they were in the camp before it was cleared. Well, just before we came on air, I spoke to Lord Dubbs, who masterminded the amendment forcing the government to promise sanctuary to more unaccompanied children from Calais. I asked him whether he was satisfied with the progress so far. I'm pleased that we are where we are. I wish we, were, we, we got where we are some months ago, uh, but I'm not satisfied, uh, nor, nor would I be for a long time, because there are still children in Calais who've got to be taken to safety, and, of course, there are still many unaccompanied child refugees in Greece. The Home Secretary, Amber was talking about 700 children that would come into the country. Are you clear how many of those children would come in um, in the next three weeks under your amendment, under the amendment that bears your name, and how many of those children would come in under other circumstances? The other circumstances being those children that have family members here. Well, I, I would have thought it's about half and half from Calais mm -hmm. uh, of the 700. I'm not totally sure because they're being assessed at the, at the moment by the French and British authorities. Uh, is it enough? I can't say it's enough because um, I, I, even assuming we clear the camp in Calais of children, and that'll be a good thing, we've got to move on to Greece as well. So I'm never going to say it's enough. Nor, nor am I saying we should take them all. Britain should take its share of the unaccompanied child refugees in Europe, so other countries should also step up to the mark. And well, uh, talking about the countries, I mean, the Home Secretary today pointed the finger at France and basically accused the French of holding up the bureaucracy that's necessary to bring the kids over. Do you agree with her? Well, from what I've learned, yes, there have been problems in France. It's taken some time to, to get the French to move fast enough. Uh, I think it's just the imminent demolition of the jungle in Calais that, 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 that has made things happen. Uh, I, I don't exonerate the Home Office from all this, but I think they've, in the recent past, they, they, they've done better than the French. How helpful, Lord Dubbs, was it last week that, the, that much of the nation, including many of the newspapers, were exercised vexed by a discussion of the ages of these children. Uh, well, it's, it's, it certainly isn't helpful, given that some of the children that have arrived the last few days are probably between 10 and 15, mm. uh, and girl, uh, quite a lot of girls among them. Uh, it, it isn't helpful. First of all, one can't always tell what the age of children, children is. If they've had a traumatic time crossing half the, over half the world, they could well look more exhausted and more tired uh, and could well look older. Uh, so but it's, it's a legitimate question to ask, isn't it, for the British public, if some of these kids look an awful lot older than 18? 
I think it's legitimate the British public should be assured that everything is being done to assess the kids, both by the French and the British authorities. People have to have confidence in what is happening. So yes, it's a legitimate question to ask, but my answer is simply that if, if one or two 19-year-olds get to Britain, the world doesn't come to an end, uh, although they shouldn't be coming here as children, but it, it might happen. Well, you came to this country as a very young refugee. Where do you think the image of Britain as a welcoming nation to the huddled masses in need stands at the moment? Well, the fact that we're taking child refugees suggests that uh, our humanitarian instincts are to the fore. Uh, although in the past, and particularly with some of the propaganda at the time of the referendum debates, uh, it, it looked as if we we're a small, mean, inward-looking country. Uh, I like to feel we have strong humanitarian instincts, and they're being exercised fully in, in the willingness of the British public to have child refugees come here. Lord Dubs, thank you very much. Thank you. Well,